Mm-hmm. Okay, and then we're gonna go live for reals. Three, <laughs> <laughs> two, one, go. Hey everyone, welcome to our Monday night happy hour with Fernway. I am Randall Oliate, and tonight again we have Miss Deborah Maroulis with us, a uh, mythologist, author, teacher, all around amazing human. Um, sure, I can even get stains out of laundry. <laughs> okay, that's a skill I need to learn. All I know is the hydrogen peroxide trick for blood. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> it, it comes in handy. <laughs> Speaking of. Oh, yeah. On that note, um, tonight we are going to talk about the heroine's journey. Um, last week we did the hero's journey. And so this is um, a reclamation of the feminine journey, perspective, storytelling narrative. Um, and Deb can explain it much better than I can. So, well, let's I'm, do it. I'm going to try. <clears throat> um, I'm not as much of an expert on this one as I am on the hero's journey. Um, see that practicing calling myself Thanks, an expert. Thanks patriarchy. Mm -hmm. I know, right? Um, but it's it's great. I, I teach this in my um, women's literature class and um, it resonates not only with women, but it resonates with a lot of, of boys, teen boys you know, that, that I teach or the, the young men that I teach too, because we all have that feminine and masculine side, right? We have attributes that that we attribute to being masculine, like um, anger and assertiveness and all these things that we have internalized as being um, masculine. But then the soft feminine things like listening and understanding and um, being still and, and loving and you know encouraging those things we internalize as feminine qualities and I told the story last week, but the author, Maureen Murdoch of The Heroine's Journey, um, was embarking on this quest, and she asked Joseph Campbell about it, and he's the author, and um, he's, The Hero's Journey is attributed to him, of course, and um, he said, women don't need their own journey. They are the journey. You're the destination. Um, women can just stop um, once they realize that they can just calm down and just appreciate the fact that they're the desire and and the the reward and Did after you really say stopped, calm down um no. <laughs> i know this is paraphrasing <laughs> yeah very 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 much so paraphrasing um, but yeah he uh he just just right over his head and um granted you know he was born in the early 1900s and um brought up in a very different way than we are living today so you know and he spent his life studying all the old white guys right and and now he's one of the old white guys that we study he's one of the old white guys that we study and we have to sort of read between the lines to get what we need out of it and we always have right i know i um, going through school reading all of the articles and reading all the books um and trying to pull out you know what was what resonated with me um on the feminine side and doing all that extra work. Well, Maureen's book, Maureen Murdoch's book, I should say, um, is tries to take that, um, that that journey with us or show us which way to go or what to expect. And so um, she wrote it and um, they just actually re-released it um, for the 30th anniversary edition. And it's kind of inverted there, but that's what it looks like. Mm. Um, and it just came out uh, last year um, or late last year. So um, there's a new forward um, by Christine Downing, who is my dissertation chair. So that's kind of cool. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's pretty much the same book. Um, I was hoping that we wouldn't need the book anymore. <laughs> that, you know, I was hoping that when I opened it up, it would be like, surprise, we, we finished. But we know that it's not true. <laughs> um, so we still have the heroine's journey. Um, it is similar to the hero's journey in that it has steps. And some of the undertaking um, for the initial steps are similar to the hero's journey um, that Campbell describes. However, um, it is very different in the language that it uses and um, how it connects to the feminine. Last week we talked about 
um, the the male hero having to connect to his feminine side to claim the mother, you know, to meet with the goddess. And the heroine does that as well, but in a very different way. So I'm going to explain the steps, um, sort of the way that I understand them. And I have notes here just because I want to make sure I get it right. So if you see me looking over here, that's why um, I'm cheating. <laughs> so um, that um, I think one of the best ways to enter this conversation is to look at why we need a hero's journey or a heroine's journey in the first place. Like what, what is it in today's context? What makes a hero? If you think of a woman that's a hero, um, what is she? What has she done? Um, I don't know, can you think of an that's example? That's a great question. Yeah. Like if we look at Hillary Clinton, maybe, um, you know, she's a hero to some, right? Um, and at least in breaking through and providing a pathway for other women like our vice president, Kamala Harris, right? She attributes mm -hmm. some of that to Clinton. Uh, Rodham Clinton now, I think she goes by. Um, I feel like as I was growing up, the definition of a hero was somebody who saved somebody's life in whatever context, mm -hmm. like stood up to a robbery happening or saved a bunch of kids from drowning when their bus fell off the side of a cliff or something like that. Yeah. And traditionally, those are always like really like masculine <clears throat> feats of strength and willpower over nature and good triumphing over evil, like that kind of uh, Beowulf sure. manic hero. Right. Yeah. And, and that's true in the hero sense, but um, usually what a hero, a hero of a culture reflects what the culture values, right? Typically. Um, mm -hmm. So like what, do, like our society today um, in the overview, grand, grandiose, capitalistic, um, Western, um, you know, America, we value productivity, being wealthy, um, owning things, right? Um, we, these are all the things that we value. And so um, women have internalized that as their journey, as well as men, right? We've seen the different waves of feminism. We deserve equal rights. We want to have the same opportunities as you, um, which are all very valid and noble <laughs> beginnings um, on, on a journey for equality. Um, but it's like all through the lens of the patriarchy. It's all about absolutely. like being at the same level as mm -hmm. men and like being able to be successful in their world. And yeah, absolutely. As, as I was growing up, I was frequently, I always participated in traditionally like men's sports or boys' mm -hmm. sports. And then if something was co ed, like, hi, my first name is Randall. And so I would just get put onto the boys' team, anyways. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I don't know, it's kind of a chicken or the egg situation. I don't know if I felt like I had to like compete and live up to my name or if it just kind of happened that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but I frequently, I thought being strong meant being like a man or being like a boy. And mm -hmm. when I was playing hockey or on the wrestling team, like I couldn't be just as good as the boys. I had to be better than them and I had to beat them at their own, mm -hmm. at their own game, whatever that was. Right. Um, and it took me a lot yeah. of years to unpack and realize that that's there's there's strength in other pieces than just yeah. being what the patriarchy says like a strong man and then of course like we use man as synonymous with person right yeah because like the yeah. ideal man is like the ideal person regardless mm -hmm. of gender expression i think we can thank the ancient greeks for that right <clears throat> ancient greeks thanks <laughs> um yeah, and you, what, you, what you said was exactly right. You have this desire to be one of the boys or one of the, you know, on the same team, you want the same rewards, accolades, all of those things that you see the boys getting. Um, and so that's where the journey actually begins um, for a girl. Um, and it's, it's that go, 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 win, win, win all the time, go fight, win, right? Um, and it, it wears women out. It, it wears us out because we have to push away the feminine side of us um, in order to um, to access that. Um, I wanted to read just a real quick um, paragraph um, from the introduction that Maureen Murdoch says herself. She says it way better than I can. That's why I want to read the paragraph. Um, she says, women do have a quest at this time in our culture 
It is the quest to fully embrace their feminine nature, learning how to value themselves as women and to heal the deep wound of the feminine. It is a very important inner journey toward being fully integrated, balanced, and whole human being. Like most journeys, the path of the heroine is not easy. It has no well-defined guideposts nor, rec nor recognizable tour guides. There is no map, no navigational chart, no chronological age when the journey begins. It follows no straight lines. It is a journey that seldom receives validation from the outside world. And in fact, the outer world often sabotages and interferes with it. And I'm sure every woman listening probably can resonate with that feeling, right? Of, of sort of being abandoned by the very thing we're supposed to want and aspire to have or become. And that's exactly where the journey starts um, for the woman. So there are 10 steps, a little bit different. Um, you arrive at the top, right? Um, or you decide you want to, you, you decide you want to be at the top, you want a PhD, or you want, um, you want to be CEO, or you want to be, I don't know, the quarterback, I don't, whatever it is that your goal is, right, that's what you want. Um, and you do everything you can to get there, right? Part of the steps are, um, you have to kind of separate from the feminine, um, all the things that we're supposed to um, attribute to the feminine. So when when we go for a PhD, what suffers? <laughs> um, home, right? Your laundry, um, the house is dirty, you have all this reading to do, you have all these papers to write, you're trying to get published, like all of these things, right, that are, are supposed to be happening. Mm -hmm. And um, personal relationships, yeah. your children. Yeah, and because women in the society are still expected to uphold all of that weight and still do the, the thing that they wanna do. And um, that's, so they do that, that's part of the journey. So they separate from the feminine. Um, they are betrayed or they're portrayed as emotional. They're portrayed as untrustworthy, which can lead to inferior, uh, dependent. And um, they have to put all that aside and they have to laugh it off like one of the boys, right? And um, they, they immerse themselves in this male dominated culture, be it a workplace or um, any or school room or whatever. And um, they uh, often do that because they wanna dispel that myth that women are weaker or inferior. Um, I know personally, and this is a little embarrassing to even share, but when I first started on my PhD journey was because I had, very influential men in my life tell me that education wasn't worth it, that I just needed to find a good man, get a good job, a little typing job till you have kids. Um, or I told it wasn't worth it because you're a mother and you don't need to spend the money. And so I kind of did it out of spite in the beginning. Um, I mean, I was very interested in what I was doing, obviously. <laughs> um, but I had a little reckoning with myself at the end of the second year. We had a professor who said, if you are going to do this um, PhD to show somebody up, don't do it. It's expensive and you'll fail. And I was like, who would, who would do that? That's stupid. Ridiculous. <laughs> right, yeah. So anyway, I had to kind of come to terms with why I wanted it um, and why I was going for that goal. And it made a huge difference um, once I figured that out. Um, so that was good. Um, so anyway, a lot of women find themselves in that spot. And I write about this a lot in my books and I write about it and I've written about it in some papers for school, um, about how we see women fight so hard against the patriarchy, but they're still so absorbed within the construct of the patriarchy, um, that they're just fighting and fighting and fighting. And then they're worn out instead of just kind of trying to rise above that perspective, um, and I talked about, again, I cannot stop talking about this book, the Cassandra Speaks book. Um, you guys would be like, shut up about this book. But it was, when I read that book, it was like, I could see the water I've been swimming in. Um, and I, I was like, oh, yes, okay. And it just shifted my whole outlook on this. Um, okay, so um, we talked about the first and stage. So, yeah, for that first step of like separating from the feminine, I also see that as, like leaving, leaving the mother or leaving nature and entering into yes, those like absolutely. patriarchal waters, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. There's this, <clears throat> this idea that 
nature is like the feminine energy, like our mother earth. And then culture is the masculine energy. Right. And all of us, when we are born, as we are born from our mother, we are taken from the feminine and like r- pulled into kicking and screaming, right? The world of the masculine. And, yeah. and that's just that very act is like the separation from. Yeah. From the, and, and look at where we are. I mean, there are no, um, there are, there are no squares in nature. Um, and we sit in a square box and we separate ourselves from the earth and we use electric light. And these are all things that remove that nature connection from us, which is nature is um, wild and unpredictable. Yeah, Just and like the feminine is wild, wild and, and wet and wild and unpredictable. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. Um, and it's, it's, um, oh, it's not what I was going to say now. Um, the, the feminine, oh, I know what I was going to say. It is, um, that connection and getting, getting low to the earth or, or having that connection to the earth. Um, and we literally deprive ourselves of it every day. And then we wonder why we're, um, hurting in some ways. Also, we're taught not to trust our bodies. Um, it is inherent in the ways that, um, we even buy shower gel. I was telling you this the other day, right? And I just told you this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That um, I was talking to my daughter about it and we were talking about how it's important to um, recognize when we're um, being told what to believe about ourselves. And so we were shopping together and we happened to walk down the shower gel aisle and I was just dumbstruck. I was like, look at this. And, and she looked and all of the, the names for the men's shower gel flavors, if you will, Things like swagger, um, oh, no. yeah, Kraken Hour, like all of these, like you know, superhero, like badass names. Like if I were taking some shower gel called Swagger and I was washing my body with that, I'd be like, yeah, like Swagger. But then you look over at the female section, right, and it's all mm-hmm. petal soft and Flowers. spring air and like whatever, mm-hmm. you know, those violet, whatever, and it's just. It's just nice to um, see that it's just, it's right there. It's embedded in, in what we put on our bodies um, mm-hmm. and the metaphors that we use in our, in our daily lives as well, the analogies that we, we talk about. So we're taught not to trust our bodies. We're taught that our intuition is not real. We're taught that um, we should look a certain way or behave a certain way. Um, and a lot of that comes from early, early church writings um, too, especially like Tertullian, um, Aquinas, like all those, all those dudes, um, you know, said, you know, a a good wife is a silent wife. Um, One who dresses up for her husband shouldn't be too cute though. This is Tertullian. Um, It's like, because a man's going to be with his woman regardless. And if you make yourself attractive, then you'll attract other men and you're sinning. So that was one of my favorites. Sure. Yeah. 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 A lot of victim so. blaming going on. <laughs> um, but yeah, like like the the aggressively gendering that grammatically doesn't make sense. The aggressive gendering of of personal hygiene products is a whole other conversation in itself. Um, sure. but it makes me think about about the invention of deodorant and antiperspirant, mm-hmm. right? Like y'all people didn't wear these things until like mm-hmm. just coming out of the depression era mm-hmm. um and it was like this really aggressive advertising campaign that convinced everybody that they needed to to wear deodorant they're like are you going to lose your job because you're the smelly one in the office you're probably the only one that doesn't wear deodorant like make sure people mm-hmm. aren't talking about you behind your back mm-hmm. <laughs> and, effective sales and again checking. that's like another right but like another mm-hmm piece of removal from nature right the way that your body exists naturally is unclean unhygienic Mm -hmm. um marks you as different or other if you don't try to mask it in some way yeah and again like I mean I don't know if I really want to equate like bo with femininity I don't know exactly where (laughs) I'm going with this but it's it's just one more layer of removal layer yeah exactly and um yeah so that's kind of where we're left with and so we the next three phases um phases two three and four are very similar to the hero's journey this is when the woman puts on her armor she gets her sword she gets on her you know trusty steed 
and rides out to conquer the dragons. And she does. She conquers that dragon so hard. <laughs> and when she gets there, she becomes the CEO or she is the quarterback or she is the PhD, you know, um, now or whatever it is. Um, she has a tenure track position or something. She looks around and she goes, okay, what's next? I thought I would be fulfilled here and I'm not. And I don't, I don't know what else to do. I'm at the top. There's nowhere else to go, but I'm empty. And this is when the real work begins um, with, with step five. Um, this is the awakening, right? Um, Chopin, I think, wrote the awakening, the story in Victorian literature. Sure. I think it's Chopin. Chopin. Anyway, um, she, it's awakening to feelings of spiritual um, solidarity, or, or sorry, aridity. So you, you're you basically you're basically a spiritual desert at this point. And um, that, yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Um, and you start to question um, why you did what you did, and then with with that, it's not a, a far jump to question your worth because you just did all the stuff and you still feel bad and therefore it wasn't a good choice. So, and you made the choice, you know, so you start to feel bad about it. You sacrificed all that stuff to get where you are and you still don't want it or you don't, you're not satisfied with it. Um, and there's a quote, she says, in the quest for desire to dispel the gender myth, that she, with the capital S here, um, has created an imbalance in herself. She sac sacrificed her dreams she sacrificed her intuition, everything, you know, the maybe, maybe being a mom, um, maybe she sacrificed getting married if that's something that she wanted to do or having a relationship um, if that's what she wanted to do, something like that. Um, <clears throat> there is a, um, a huge uh, connection to body wisdom, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, but I want to read you this quote from Joseph Campbell um real quick and I just saw the hairs yeah. um <laughs> he said or she um Murdoch says according to Campbell woman is primarily concerned with fostering she can foster a body foster a soul foster a civilization foster a community if she has nothing to foster she somehow loses the sense of her function and Murdoch goes on to say I find that many women who have embraced the masculine hero's journey have forgotten how to foster themselves they have assumed that to be successful they have to keep their edges sharp and in that process many have ended up with a hole in their hearts and i agree uh, that's where i was when i went into the myth program you know um, my daughter had brain surgery at 13 you know we battled her epilepsy and then she woke up partially paralyzed um, and it took her almost two years to get fully functioning again lots of driving to therapies and battling the schools with IEPs and switching schools and myself I was in graduate school getting my English master's um, working full-time you know learning to be a teacher just it was insane and um, I was just empty I was done and then I saw the ad for the myth program and that was like I'm going this is a no-brainer this is what I need and thank god so it's been it's been great I mean except for all the stress and the crying in the papers but it's been great <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah um I think I think that does happen to a lot of women you know they start to feel that longing for that connection um okay so this is the next step number six is the initiation and descent to the goddess now I know in the hero's journey we have the belly of the whale they de the hero descends right he dies and has to meet the goddess and atone with the father this is a little different. Um, this is this is a period when you are learning to listen to yourself. Um, a really hard thing for a lot of women to do, especially successful, what we call successful in the society, um, to do. Um, I asked my daughter the other day. She was asking me about something that she was wondering if she should do it, and I said, "What does your body say?" And she was like, "I don't know." <laughs> said, well, ask yourself the question, close your eyes and sit with it and, and see what happens in your body. Does your stomach hurt? Do your throat clench? Do you get excited? You know, does your heart race good or bad? And, and figure it out. Then you'll know what you want to do. It'll be your decision. And you won't have to have outside, 
you know, looking and um, influencing you. Mm-hmm. And in our culture, especially now, there's so much influencing everywhere we go. It's an ad or a person telling us what to think or how to feel or what we could do to be better. It's just nonstop, no matter where you are. I know it's, um, it's advertisements disguised as authentic, genuine information. Yeah, absolutely. We could talk about that in education and curriculum if you want later. Yeah. <laughs> I, always, I always do a whole unit on that. Just, just learn to think for yourself, please. Um, okay. Um, so that leads us to number seven, where we start yearning to connect with the feminine, right? And this is, this is the part where women typically retreat and they're seen as a dropout of society or they just quit doing it. And I did that. I, I quit my full-time job um, when I realized all of this and going through it. I just, I couldn't do it anymore. I didn't want to have two jobs and try to be a writer and be a full-time grad student and a mother and a wife. You know, I, it was, it was a big pay cut, but I, it just wasn't worth it. I just wasn't, I was dead on my feet, you know, all the time. Mm-hmm. And um, this is when it's very scary. This is where we get that dark, unpredictable side of femininity, um, where that wild wildness in the in the nature goddesses comes out. Um, we start to get low to the ground. Um, we listen. We ask our bodies what it needs, and usually we go to sleep for about a month <laughs> or so. We read a lot of books. Maybe we watch really bad TV, and we cry, and we eat ice cream, or we go for walks, or we, we get really into gardening. You I know, very recently had a month like that. Yeah, yeah, and and we just need it. Um, and you really need to, for as, as long as you've been ignoring the feminine side of you, and and embracing the masculine side, you have to refill that well. That well is bone dry. So it, later on, we're gonna talk about how they come together, but right now in this process, you have to wholeheartedly inherently embrace the feminine. There's just no other way to do it. Um, and, and that's, you know, people can, maybe they start dancing, maybe, like I said, they take up gardening. Um, there's all kinds of different things that, that we can do. The, our dreams sometime intensify. We can start dreaming about wild animals um, coming to us or showing us things. Um, I know that's pretty common. I, I haven't had that one happen, but um, I've talked to other women who talk about, they say that happens all the time. And I've but had students come about wild me. animals. Mm-hmm. But it's like they're, um, you know, in, in psychology, we look at dreams as projections of our of ourselves in some ways. And so it's that part of themselves that's coming to them asking for attention. Um, so that's depending on what kind of animal or what the associations to the animal are, you know, I'm not a, a dream analyst by any means, but <laughs> just, just from what I've read. Um, and I'm, sh- you know, just as much as I do on the subject. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's the seventh step. The eighth step is what, um, Murdoch calls healing the mother-daughter split. And it doesn't necessarily mean literal mother-daughter because as a woman, we have three phases, right? Just like Hecate, just like the moon. We have the waning, um, I'm sorry, the waxing phase, which is, you know, the the young coming into maturity. There it is, yes, exactly. (laughs) And then we have the full mature, you know, woman. And then we have the waning side going into the crone. Um, old lady getting gray hair and um, what we're talking about yeah (laughs) and um, (laughs) yeah wrinkles and all that fun stuff and um sorry I just lost my train of thought oh that mother so it's not necessarily like a literal return to the mother but more kind of like a return to To nature feminine values and well, no, it's also a return of yourself or yeah, return to your younger self and, and healing mm-hmm. that, that trauma that happened between your younger self and your current self. And, um, we, you can, um, you can have it in a, I mean, a lot of mother daughters make up in this phase, um, real mother daughters. And I, I, I would be curious, like my mom died five years ago, but it would be very interesting to be able to talk to her now, um, in what I've learned and what I've experienced and who I've become in these last several years. Um, and then how she was, she was 
crazy, crazy driven feminists. Like, you know, that second wave of just insane stuff going on there. Um, that's a whole other episode. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so that would be an interesting conversation. Um, but we, you can see this, like there are, there are stories and there are movies that, um, that embody this and, um, the Hunger Games does a really good job, I think, of showing the mother-daughter split, like Katniss is so removed from the feminine. Um, I know a lot of people claim she can be Diana, um, or Artemis, right? She's with her an archer. <laughs> yes, she's an archer, but, um, she's, she's really, um, in her maiden phase, very feminine. I mean, she takes over as the dad, right? She's the provider right. for the family. She's all of these. She hates her mother. She's, you know, pissed at her. And um, then as she comes back around, and then at the end of the trilogy, you know, she is a mother. Um, she heals that split within herself and also with her mother. And she loses. Spoiler alert. Yeah, sorry. Um, she loses the, <laughs> the maiden, um, literally and figuratively. Um, and so I think that's a, it's a cool way of telling the story. It's sad, but it's, it's also good. Um, okay, so that's the healing of the mother-daughter split. Um, you start to reclaim things. You start to reclaim your feelings. I feel this way and it's valid. I am allowed to feel this way. And if somebody gaslights you and says, no, you're not supposed to feel that way, you can be like, oh, yes, I can. And just be nice about it. Um, you... That, that felt personal. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I just promise nice I wasn't about it. No, you don't know you don't have to be nice about it. Um, but usually once you've hit the stage, you don't have to show them that you know what they're doing. It's like, okay, I see you and I am bored by you at this point. Like it's you don't have to acknowledge that. That's what I mean about rising out of that patriarchal waters of that. You know, you see it and they're, they're telling you these you things. You start realizing that shit doesn't work your time and energy. Yeah. And you move on and they're over there sprawling and doing whatever they got to do. And you're just like, good luck with that. That looks like it hurts. <laughs> you should probably get that looked at or talk to someone. Um, so you start to reclaim your intuition, like that, that body, like, you know, that knowledge that we, that we hold in our bodies. And, you know, there, there is some science, um, that backs that idea with this new DNA. And I don't know nearly enough about it. I certainly not an expert. I probably shouldn't even bring it up because I know almost nothing about it. But it's so fascinating that people are now studying how we carry trauma in our mm -hmm. DNA and how we transfer that. And so there is a body wisdom that we carry and, and we listen to uh, or should listen to, right? And this is that time where we start to reclaim that. Um, we start to reclaim our sexuality. Um, you know, women are taught to be the Madonna and the whore at the same time, right? You, what do they say? A lady in the streets and a freak in the sheets, or I don't know, that's a, such a Gen X thing to say. Um, <laughs> I think that was a song. I don't know. Anyway, um, it, it's just, it, we're taught to the, have this, you know, nasty side to us, but also be the sweet little girl. Um, well, and still both of those are like existing within the male gaze, like within yeah. the structure of the patriarchy. Yeah. I, Someone... I always use the example from Sex in the City. Outdated. No, good. With when Charlotte marries Troy, Trey? Trey. And Trey? Trey. I think so. The weird one. And he can't, yeah, yeah. And he can't get it up mm -hmm. because he holds her up on a pedestal yeah. and she is only the Madonna and he mm -hmm. cannot defile her because yeah. like, and she doesn't even have any agency in this yeah. situation, right? Yeah. It's not her choice. Like this is how he sees her in her nice white nightgown and he can't possibly soil her right. because then what would she be? I just keep thinking about in the scene where she grace. discovers, yeah, where she discovers him and then the, she changes up his magazines, <laughs> puts her face in all of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. But yeah, there's that falling from grace thing, right? Yeah, I know we were talking about that earlier about Eve. She fell from grace in her hero's journey and was not allowed to get up. Mm -hmm. She just wasn't allowed the redemption arc that all the male people in the biblical stories get. She just stayed down. Um, <clears throat> so once, um, oh, what else was I gonna talk about reclaiming? Oh, reclaiming creativity and reclaiming mm. humor. Um, I thought that was an interesting one because 
I've always had a really dark sense of humor. And as I've gotten in this last year, I've gotten, I just think sillier things are funny now. Like I, I read something today when I was researching, this guy's name was Academus. And the, the way the sentence was structured is Academus had learned. And I was like, no shit. <laughs> and I just laughed forever. And I was like, I probably should take a break because it's really not funny. But I mean, you know, I just, I don't have to laugh at mean things anymore. I can laugh at silly things, which is, I thought that was kind of eye-opening for myself. Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, because especially, I know like, as women, we're often taught by society to tear other women down. And that's something that yeah. makes us special or unique. Mm-hmm. Um, I always thought that that was something special about myself is that I'm, I'm not like other girls and I'm one of the boys and like, I don't need any of that other stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but why, why is that a good thing? Yeah. Like it, yeah. It, it, it's neither good nor bad. It, it's, it, just it is. <laughs> yeah. But we, we put value statements on that because we are taught to, we're, we're, we have that embedded in our brains. Um, okay, <clears throat> so once we hit that, we get to number nine, which is healing the wounded masculine. We've been so engrossed in the feminine and we've healed that mother-daughter split. Um, we, we've, we've filled our wells, if you will. Um, and now there's that less need for outer approval, like we were just talking about. Um, less need to be recognized. Um, We just do what we do because it's what we want and it's who we are. Um, I had a, I had an interesting experience with this last week and I work with a writing coach who is fantastic. And if anybody wants her information, if you are a writer, I will give it to you. She is amazing. Um, And she had me, um, I, I had an offer for a a book and I I wanted to take it, but I I wasn't sure that that's the path that I wanted to go for my career. And there was a couple other options and I I have to be vague, I'm sorry. Um, And so she was like, well, let's let's work through it. Let's ask your your body, like, what what are you doing? And so I did, and she took me through this little exercise about what was important to me. And I realized what was important to me and then it didn't matter if I had that book deal or not. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, that's cool. Like, this is why I'm doing this. This is what I, what I want from it. And then the outside stuff didn't, didn't matter anymore. Um, and then literally, I'm not even joking, a half an hour later, the thing that I wanted the most happened. And I, I think I, I, was, I was able to react to it and and appreciate it for what it was but I think I would have reacted to it differently if it had even happened a day before because I wasn't in the same mindset I I hadn't like integrated that masculine and that feminine on that on that yet um so once we've healed that wounded masculine we have to integrate them we have to be both masculine and feminine we all do in um psychological terms we call that um why did the word just go out of my head individuation there it is <laughs> like what's that word oh, I hate that it's happening so often now <laughs> uh-oh you know that word with that thing it does that stuff and it's made um, of letters it's made of letters yeah how'd you know um <laughs> so the psychological process of individuation yes so it's that idea of um integrating both we have to be um a spiritual warrior almost where we have to be protective of all those feminine qualities that we've now gained and be able to access them to refill our wells whenever we can. But also we live in this society. We have to be able to provide if that's our job. We have to be able to, um, you know, be around the stuff that depletes us and, and see it for what it is and then, and be a woman anyway. And, and that's the heroine's journey. And it's, um, she does say that this is a cyclic journey. It happens multiple times in a woman's life. Um, and that's just because of where we live and, and how the world works. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's it. I, there's one more quote I wanted to read to you. It's short. It's by uh, Marion Woodman, who is amazing. Um, and she said, uh, but if you travel far enough, One day you will recognize yourself coming down the road to meet yourself and you will say, yes. And I just love that. I just think that's, 
the perfect like way to embody the heroine's journey you will meet yourself on the road someday and you'll be like i know you that's cool <laughs> that is cool yeah and i think it's really important to note that the heroine's journey isn't just for women oh yeah absolutely and the not. hero's journey isn't just for men right we we have like our language is so limited in in presenting the world in this gender binary and we mm -hmm. have a lot of conversations that have been happening like in the mainstream now introducing new pieces of language and naming gender expressions that have always existed but we have oftentimes lacked language for especially like yeah. in our mainstream popular culture and sure. so this integration and individuation of the masculine and the feminine i mean i feel like that right there is the the freedom it, 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 it's like breaking free from that gender binary and I think our yeah. language is just so frustratingly limited when we're saying like the hero's journey or the heroine's journey. Like right. it's it should be a person's journey. Right. Yeah. Like the yeah. human journey. The human journey. Um, and you know, English is a very utilitarian language, right? It it was meant to be useful. It was in quick, right? Unlike Latin, <laughs> which would take you 25 days to tell someone directions to go down the street and get well, you. An I mean, ice cream. like English is basically a pigeon language. Sure. We're all yeah. over the place. Yeah. But there, we don't have words for the feminine side of things. Not really. We have we have masculine words written by men, um, like Shakespeare, um, who invented what we believe in as feminine. So that's a little breathtaking. Like we have to look at those things. Um and quick reminder to anyone not super familiar with Shakespearean production during Shakespearean times, um, they were all dudes. Everyone yes. in the cast was a dude. Yes. Every single one. Mm -hmm. And so it was dudes pretending to be women, wearing wigs, like, oh, you know, just yeah. like, yeah. or from, from what we can tell, you know, probably overselling it a little bit. Yeah, and it's the written, the I mean, how many words did Shakespeare invent, right? Yeah. And it's, we use these terms all the time, and they are- If there even was the a Shakespeare. Well, yeah, we, we can, that's a whole other episode too, we can go there. He's <laughs> <laughs> um, really the queen's bastard son, just kidding. Mm. So yes, uh, the works attributed to one Mr. Yeah. William Shakespeare. Yeah. It's it's the water that we're swimming in, right? The, mm -hmm. the, what I was talking about earlier, it's that water of, the patriarchal um, idea and value system that we are ever present in. And it's it's really hard to see through that. And I'm struggling with it with my dissertation right now because I'm trying to rework the hero's journey into a human journey. And just finding the, the words to do it is, well, let's just say I'm surprised I still have hair. So. <laughs> but but yeah like the way that language shapes our worldview is is really fascinating i mean there's that that famous example that the inuit have 48 different words for snow mm -hmm. because that is their everyday environment right it te when you look at a language it teaches you about that culture now that's not necessarily true um but that's the the famous anthropological example and I just, I mean, I don't have any words for snow. I'm like, well, that snow I think is ice and that snow I think is powdery, right? Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it's not something that's in my cultural daily lived experience. And so I don't necessarily need the language for it. Right. Um, and the best part about language, I didn't realize this was gonna turn into a language thing, but the best part about language is how it's completely arbitrary, right? We assign meaning to all of these things and mm -hmm. the community can create words and put them in our everyday lexicon. And we and can also take the power away from words or change what words mean, yeah. take back and reclaim meaning mm -hmm. of it language happens all as the well. Time. Yeah, absolutely. All the uh, time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's happening, now. it's happening, I think at a faster rate almost too with mm -hmm. social media, especially TikTok. Um, people talking to each other all the time. It's such a weird time to be alive with all of this Im immense connection, yet we're still mm -hmm. so entirely isolated. 
um, like it's just so strange. Um, that's another whole paper. Right, right. <laughs> we yeah, just come up whole, with all these great topics. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I mean, like look at something like irregardless. Irregardless yeah. is now in the dictionary, meaning the same thing as regardless. Mm -hmm. So as an English teacher, it makes me cringe when my students use it because now spell check doesn't catch it because it's a real word. Yeah. But what can I do? Right. I mm -hmm. can't just be like clinging to the old ways. Yeah. Um, that was hard for me to get over too. That's that one, especially. Well, um, yeah. That one like cuts me, cuts me yeah. real deep. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I, and that there's somebody asked me a question last summer. Um, not me. Somebody asked a question and I took it upon myself to try and answer it, not, or at least consider it. And they said, why is the standard American English, why is that the preferred way to speak? Why isn't it another way that maybe another culture in America speaks? And I was like, well, damn, that's true. And just like all of my, however many years of English <laughs> degrees and training and teaching and all of that, I was just like, you're right, it doesn't matter. I mean, I guess it could matter depending on which place you wanted to work when you, you know, got out of school, but it honestly, it's like you said, it's arbitrary. It doesn't matter. And I would it's, love to be able to develop some sort of language around this feminine ideology, you know, mm -hmm. that, that is independent of um, the patriarchal construct. It would be fantastic. I know. Ooh, that's a tall yeah. order. It is. Um, but yeah, and I mean, I think something that we really need to keep in mind too is like dictionaries aren't the rule makers, right? right. Dictionaries are the records. They're, They're the, the records, records that we that. keep of the language that we already have. Um, yeah, that's excellent. And y'all, language and writing and the printing press uh, existed before standardized English language dictionary. Yes. <laughs> um, English is a freaking Mess. grab bag. Yeah. Yeah. Of, yeah. of a lot of fun stuff. And that could be a whole other a whole other conversation. Can I talk imagine? about this in my classes. I'm sure you do too. It's, yeah, absolutely. It's really, really fun. <laughs> it is. It is fun. Um, but to for our purposes tonight, talking about you know this whole idea of stepping out of these waters that we're in and returning into a more intuitive state, um, maybe it isn't necessarily even about words. Maybe it's about listening um, and and looking for intention in the words which is, can be difficult, um, especially if it's through email or text or something like that, but you don't have those personal clues or the energy coming through. I know a lot of teachers suffered and I, students did too this last year trying to be on Zoom, but yep. there's, not, there's that transfer energy that's usually so alive in a classroom. You can read the room and know what's sinking in, what's not, you know, um, who's connecting, who's not, and that's all gone. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's just so that leads to that more isolation and that less feeling of the whale of well feeling empty um it's just a lot you know um to handle and uh and it's I, interesting I, you bring that up especially with teaching being traditionally a woman's job sure. position yeah. yeah right like yeah depending on that ebb and flow and exchange of not just information, but, but energy and, mm -hmm. and emotion and feeling. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, I know for me, like I teach because I'm selfish, right? I teach because I like it. I teach because Same. I love that exchange of energy and, mm -hmm. and that back and forth and that flow and teaching somebody a piece of information that they never had before and seeing their face light up with understanding and making connections and now they're critically thinking and they're engaged in the discussion and uh oh class class ends in 30 seconds but nobody wants to go home because we have this like this whole back and forth yeah. going and they're on. still talking about it when they leave the room mm -hmm. they're still arguing or oh, i just love that so much <laughs> i sit over there i'm just yes yes, yes i get it <laughs> so um good. And I like to pretend that it's altruistic, but the truth is I love it, right? And that's why yeah, that's why the teaching profession is is underpaid because it's fueled by passion. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I wonder too, if um, we were to ask male teachers um, if they rely on that ebb and flow or if it's a different 
energy for them or if they even recognize an energy um and i'm sure some do i'm not trying to allude that you know women are this way and all men are this way i don't mean that at all i just am curious right. about what the answers might be you know um, i can think of a few male teachers that i had growing up that were great at it um one in particular he's the teacher i hear in my my head when i'm teaching sometimes you know i still i took a lot of what i learned from him and and made it my own but there's also some male teachers that i had that weren't so great at it at all and then I, I can think of a, a female teacher that was pretty awful at it too. So, you know, it's, yeah. But then again, that's like getting into the gender binary and like mm -hmm. looking at everything through that lens. Yeah. And so I wonder, I wonder it, what other it, language it, that we could use, like, what could we call it besides masculine and feminine energy? Like, could well, we call it like nature versus culture? Could we call it Apollo versus Dionysus? Like, yeah. I like the nature versus culture. That's pretty interesting. But then we're assuming culture is inherently going inherently to stay the same. Yeah, and yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting and not male masculine. See, language mm -hmm. matters, y'all. It's a, so important, and it's it's frustrating me that we don't have the appropriate language, and our conversation is limited to masculine and feminine energy. Like where where does non-binary gender expression fit? We need a think in this tank. conversation. Yeah, come at us if you have um, some better language that's out there that we could use. Um, or if you're interested in continuing this conversation further, maybe joining us for one of these talks if you've got yeah. if you've got experience in this in this space. Um, it's it's so frustrating. And, and I see those lists sometimes on um, words that exist in other languages that perfectly describe a feeling that you have, but you weren't able to name until seeing this word. Um, mm -hmm. Like the famous German, I think it's Schodenfraud. Freud, I think. Yeah, Freud. Schodenfraud. Yeah. Schodenfraud. Mm -hmm. Y'all, yeah. my German is terrible. I'm so sorry to all my German friends. Um, <laughs> it's the feeling that you get watching some like it's the joyful feeling that you get watching somebody get hurt or fail right. that you yeah. want to fail like that feeling you get when your ex shows up at a party without a date or their date is just <laughs> like horrible and it like makes you feel good about yourself. when uh when the when the coyote chasing the roadrunner gets hurt right <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, exactly. that was traumatic for me as a kid i could not i couldn't watch those i would change the channel and tom and jerry hated it hated it i could not handle that i'm terrible with america's funny somebody else too. energy cannot Ooh, yeah. yeah i cannot oh, see, i don't think and you're just... and you're a gen xer you didn't grow you're not the jackass generation i'm officially no. rebranding millennials as the jackass generation because that was such a formative oh, part yeah no. of my mm -hmm. teenage experience mm -hmm. <laughs> and i watch it now and i'm like oh no like i can't i can't yeah. handle this but um masculine yeah, energy it, it's it's part of that right yeah mm -hmm. how many times can we kick someone in the balls when they're not expecting it and think that it's <laughs> hilarious <laughs> um and there are all sorts of other expressions and other languages for very very specific feelings um that would take us an entire sentence to discuss in english so if you know any of these really fun words um let us yeah, know too sure. that could be a that, be... that could be a really cool conversation mm -hmm. um and that's the name of this well, now I using so much German language and my German is terrible, but our name, right? Fernway Collective. Yeah. Fernway is that intense ache or longing for a place that you've never been before. It's mm -hmm. a far sickness, the opposite of homesickness. Mm -hmm. um, and I love to think of Fernway as not just a far sickness for a physical place that you've never been before, but also for these like unexplored corners of the mind or information mm -hmm. um yeah did you notice the last chapter name of the cassandra speaks book it is i did way. not it's fair way. come on come on i'm this telling book you it's just killing it i'm um, telling you it's perfect so for everybody interested in the heroine's journey you know you can find the book on our website at fernwaycollective.org and mm -hmm. all of your purchases go toward funding our nonprofit. um and also we had the idea to do maybe like a 
happy hour book club where we could That's take fun. a look at a book, uh, maybe break it down by chapters and we could have these conversations that you could tune in live or watch later and, and comment and join the conversation. Uh, let us know if you'd be interested in that because we would love to do Cassandra and, Speaks. Yeah, I would love to do that book and Next even month. any others, maybe some um, other books you would want to know about. Yeah, if anybody has any suggestions, let us know. I'm just running to grab my copy. There it is. Um, so, pretty. so let us know if you would be interested in reading through this book with us. Um, it's called Cassandra Speaks, When Women Are the Storytellers, The Human Story Changes by Elizabeth Lesser. Um, I have been it, listening to it like it's the radio in my car. Every time I get in the car, <laughs> I just continue on. I went through the first book, the first part of it, I think three or four times at this point. It's just fantastic. It is. And I'm only on page 11 and it's already <laughs> absolutely incredible. But to be fair, I did move this week. I've had a lot going on. Well, and um, I have to drive to the Bay Area every now and then. And, you know, it's a long drive for me. And so I get to listen to books in the cars. So I get extra reading time. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, let us know. Um, oh, Denise. Yeah, that would be great. Um, if you're interested in doing this book club with us, you'll be able to find this book on our website as well in our Fernway Collective shop. Um, and if you are, yeah, just, just let us know. Or if you have another book that you'd like to see us discuss um, or have a topic in mind for a future happy hour or anything like that, just let us know in the comments. And we're, we're super excited, right? That's a collective part of our name. Like we want everybody to have a voice and yeah, to absolutely. be able to contribute to what we're doing. Um, you can check us out on YouTube as well. We just started a YouTube channel where we repost all of our live happy hours. Um, and we have a new section of collective contributions where some of our students have made great videos that we'll be posting up there um, and any other volunteers. So yeah, come at us and let us know what you want to see. Let us know how we can how we can best serve you. What are you, what are you looking for on this, on this and journey teachers, that we can help facilitate? Right? If one of the, one of my goals too, and I know Randall's too, is the um, open resources. And if mm -hmm. there's things you want lectures on or, you know, materials that we can help um, do, you know, I'm happy to, to share any kind of knowledge that I have and whatever, if it makes a teacher's job easier, I'm going to do it. So just Heck let yeah. us know. Yeah. Heck yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining and uh, we will see y'all next week. Yeah. Hi. Same, same bat time, same bat channel. Now what's Gen X? <laughs> <laughs>